Well, good evening, everyone. As our musicians leave the platform, let's, uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer before we study his word. Lord, what a tender and precious moment this is as we gather to remember the birth of Christ. Lord, may you prepare our hearts now to receive your word. May there be a tenderness, a love for you, not just emotionally, but an understanding, a love based on understanding that Christ Jesus came into this world, humbled himself to come into this world to save sinners like us. We pray if anyone here doesn't know the Savior, may tonight be the night of their salvation. We thank you for what we've been able to sing, what we've heard, and may our hearts be in response to your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, tablets, or can look on the screen, I want to read to you Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, the Christmas story. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. And he did this in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. Now, there are over 31,000 verses in the Bible. Yet the next verse that I'm about to read to you from Luke's gospel is perhaps the most profound one of them all because it tells us that the invisible God became visible man and he was born into this world. I'm referring to Luke chapter 2 verse 7 and she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, it may surprise you to know that this is the only mention in the Bible of the actual birth of Jesus Christ. In all four Gospels, this is the only one that actually mentions the account of his birth. Though Matthew tells us about events relating to the birth of Christ, he never records the actual birth of Jesus. Same is true of the other gospel writers, Mark and John. Neither of them gives any information about Christ's birth. Mark, for example, starts his gospel story by telling us about the ministry of John the Baptist and introduces Jesus to us as a grown adult at his baptism. And John, the apostle John, well, he opens his gospel account by taking us back to eternity past telling us that the Word was in the beginning and that the Word was God and that the Word became human flesh. But John doesn't mention anything about the actual birth of Jesus. That event is reserved for Luke, the only gospel writer given the unique assignment by the Holy Spirit to record for us the actual event of the birth of our Lord. And surprisingly, Luke writes, it, writes of it with amazing brevity and simplicity without overstating anything. Luke simply tells us that there was a decree issued by Caesar for a census to be taken that brought Joseph and Mary to the village, the town of Bethlehem, where she would give birth to Jesus. Then Luke records the actual birth and finally tells us about the announcement of the birth by an angel to some local shepherds who were watching over their flocks nearby. However, although Luke's narrative is rather brief and simple in its presentation, I want you to understand that there are, there are profound truths that Luke reveals in this passage about the character of God, as seen in the events surrounding Christ's birth as well as his actual birth. And in doing so, Luke tells us a great deal about our Lord that really should encourage us because while the world, frankly, cares nothing about the birth of Christ except that it gives them an occasion to celebrate the holiday of Christmas, the truths involving the incarnation, the incarnation, the enfleshment of Christ should leave us, if you're a believer in Christ, it should leave you in awe of God. 
Now, the way that Luke presents his material is that in giving us the details concerning Christ's birth, he reveals two specific truths about God's character, really Christ's character. This evening, we want to look at these two truths. The first one being this. We're going to see God's sovereignty as revealed in the birth of Christ, the events surrounding his birth. Verse 1, let's go back to Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. Now, with this statement, Luke begins to tell us about how Jesus was born into this world. And it's a, a passage that most of us, perhaps even all of us, are familiar with because it is the Christmas story and therefore we're, we're reminded of it every year. And yet it is so easy to read this verse and still miss so many important truths. And one of the reasons we miss these important truths is because in focusing on the actual birth of Christ, we tend to overlook this opening verse, which reveals the historical context of his birth, and it actually sets in motion the one event that led to his birth fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. But it's critical that we understand the historical context because, folks, in doing so, we see something wonderful about the character of God. Now, notice Luke states that in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Now, immediately, we have a number of questions that we need answered. The first one being this. When Luke says in those days, what days is he referring to? Very easy for us to read that and then not even think about that. But he said in those days, what days is he talking about? Well, the answer to this question is found towards the beginning of chapter 1 of the Gospel of Luke, where we read in verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea. In other words, all of this, all of this what? The angel Gabriel appearing to Zacharias, Gabriel also appearing to Mary, the birth of John the Baptist, and now the birth of Jesus. All of these things, these events, took place in the days when Herod the Great ruled over Israel as Rome's puppet king. Second question we need to answer is who was Caesar Augustus? Because Luke says that in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Well, it's obvious by this man having the name Caesar that he is a leader. He is the head of Rome. While Herod ruled over Israel, this man was the absolute ruler of the entire Roman Empire at the time because, as I said, he was a Caesar. But notice he was not simply called Caesar. He's called Caesar Augustus. That's significant. Why is it significant? Well, understand this. Augustus was not his last name. He was not Caesar Augustus. Rather, it was his title. It means the majestic one, the supreme one, the revered one. And history reveals that it was this particular Caesar who was the first one to bear this label, Augustus. Now, why is that fact important? Well, it's important because until this man embraced this particular title for himself, the designation Augustus was reserved exclusively for the pagan gods that the Roman people worshipped. But it was under the reign of Caesar Augustus that men, that men for the first time ever, they began to think of the Caesars as gods. In fact, they went beyond thinking of this man as a god. There are indications found among ancient Roman ruins that Caesar Augustus was actually being called by his followers savior of the world. So, in telling us about this ruler in Rome in connection with the birth of Christ, Luke is intentionally presenting a stark contrast between the exalted Caesar Augustus, the one who was back in Rome celebrating himself as savior of the world and the true savior of the world, Jesus Christ, who humbly entered this world in an obscure Middle Eastern town without any fanfare and in the most modest way. He was wrapped in strips of cloth, then placed in an animal feeding trough for a crib. However, not only do we see a stark contrast between this man who thought he was august and supreme and Christ who truly is august and supreme, 
But we also see God's sovereignty in action. And that's what I want to focus on for a few minutes. We see God's sovereignty in action as he moved upon Caesar Augustus to unwittingly, unwittingly accomplish his will. Notice again how verse 1 reads. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. Luke tells us that in those days... What days? The days when Herod ruled Judea, that a decree, what's a decree? It's an imperial edict, was issued by Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all people who were under the control of the Roman Empire. And the purpose of this census, we learn, is, was for taxation. That was the reason. History reveals that this wasn't the only census that Caesar Augustus took during his reign, there were many registrations like this one ordered by him, some different purposes, some for the purpose of listing young men for military service, some for the purpose of taxing those whom rule, who Rome ruled over. Now this census, as you know, as I just mentioned, we see it in the text, was to register people in order to tax them. And just to distinguish this from any other census, notice Luke adds in verse 2 that this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now Luke mentions this man, this man by the name of Quirinius, because as governor of the region of Syria, he was the one responsible for overseeing this census in the land of Israel. And it's the land of Israel that Luke, our writer, is focused on because of the effect that this census would, would have upon the birth of Jesus, as we see in the following verses. Notice verses 3 through 5. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage or family of David in order to register along with Mary who was engaged to him and was with child. Now Luke tells us that as a result of this census ordered by Caesar Augustus, it was required that everyone register for this by going to his own city. And by own city, it means their ancestral home, the town where their ancestors were from and where their ancestors and they identified with. And therefore, for Joseph and Mary, this meant traveling from the town of their residence, which was Nazareth in the Galilee area, to the town of Bethlehem, which was in the region of Judea. And the reason for this was because Bethlehem was the birthplace of the great King David, and both Joseph and Mary were descendants, physical descendants of David making Bethlehem their ancestral home. Now, this was a very difficult and challenging journey of about 80 to 90 miles, and Mary was advanced in her pregnancy. So some have wondered why Mary made this journey in the first place. Why did she go with Joseph? Because according to Roman law at the time, usually only the man of the house was required to register for a census. Therefore, one has to wonder why Joseph subjected Mary to such a grueling, difficult journey being so far along in her pregnancy. Was he being selfish by bringing her along? No. On the contrary, he was being very kind. He was being very sensitive, very considerate towards Mary because he knew how uncomfortable it was for her back in Nazareth since no doubt her pregnancy, which was rather obvious, was the subject of a great deal of gossip and slander. And so Joseph obviously didn't want also, we would say it would be clear that Joseph didn't want to miss the birth of Jesus, so he took Mary with him. However, all of these reasons I've just given for Mary traveling with Joseph to Bethlehem, they're certainly, I believe they're valid, but they're only human reasons. Only human reasons. The real and ultimate reason for Mary traveling with Joseph to Bethlehem was because in eternity past, God sovereignly ordained that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and so she had to be there to give birth to him. This is precisely what the Old Testament 
prophet predicted 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Micah 5.2 says these now famous words. <laughs> but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Now, I want us to, to pause at this point and consider how God sovereignly, sovereignly controlled and orchestrated these events in order to fulfill what his word said would happen. That takes us back to verse 1 where we read that a pagan ruler by the name of Caesar Augustus, he decided to take a census. And in doing so, he unknowingly did the will of God. So that Joseph and Mary would be in the exact place where 700 years earlier God said the Messiah would be born. You see, my friends, what this reveals is that God is sovereign, meaning he's in total control over human governments and their rulers. Meaning he is in, as I just said, he is in control in every detail of their lives and our lives. And he uses them, these leaders, whether they believe in him or not, to accomplish exactly what he has decreed, what he has ordained. The scriptures make it very clear that government rulers, regardless of how much they think that they're in control over their people, they cannot do anything outside of God's sovereign plan. Without realizing it, God uses them to accomplish his will. Listen to what the Bible declares concerning God ruling over the nations of the world and their leaders, in that he is the one who raises up governments and government leaders, and he is the one who disposes of them when they have served his purpose. Isaiah Chapter 40, verses 23 and 24. It is he who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither. It was John Newton, the writer of that great hymn, Amazing Grace, who said these words about God's sovereignty over world rulers. Newton said... The kings of the earth are continually disturbing the world with their schemes of ambition. They expect to carry everything before them and have seldom any higher end in view than the gratification of their own passions. But in all they do, they are but servants of this great king and lord and fulfill his purposes. They had one thing in view, he had another. And because God is sovereign over world governments and world leaders, he controls the decisions that every world leader makes. We read this in the Word of God, Proverbs 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is is from the Lord. Now, what is this referring to? Well, in ancient times, lots, similar to what we would call the tossing of dice, uh, is, um, were used to make important government decisions, critical to the functioning of that nation, known as lots. However, Solomon tells us here, in Proverbs 16, verse 33, that God was in control over every decision made by this method. It may look like chance, it may look like fortune, it may look like luck, but no, he is in control over every decision made by this method. But his sovereignty wasn't limited to control over the casting of lots in ancient times. It went far beyond that because there are times both in the past and today, today, when God just puts a thought into a government ruler's mind, and that ruler isn't even conscious of this. For example, we, we read that Solomon had a son by the name of Rehoboam. When uh, he became king over Israel, that is Rehoboam, he made a very foolish decision that negatively affected the entire, and I mean the entire, history of Israel. Here's how author Jerry Bridges in his classic book, 
trusting God explains what happened then and why it happened Bridges writes when Rehoboam came to the throne the men of Israel asked him to lighten the harsh labor and their heavy yoke Solomon his father had put on them Rehoboam first consulted the elders who had served his father They advised him to give the people a favorable answer. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders and consulted the young men who he had grown up with. They advised him to answer the people harshly. As a result, ten tribes of Israel revolted against Rehoboam, splitting the kingdom. Now, why would this man, this man Rehoboam, do such a foolish thing? Well, the Bible tells us why. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 15. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was, note this folks, it was a turn of events from the Lord that he might establish his word, which the Lord spoke through Ahijah the Shelemite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. What we read here, is that God guided the mind of this new king to accomplish exactly what he wanted accomplished and what he predicted through a prophet would happen without the king even realizing that he was doing God's will. Rehoboam couldn't care less what God had to say. But God fulfilled his word. Now what does this mean that government rulers are mere puppets? Is that what this means? Not at all. Does God force them to make decisions against their will? No, not at all. Rulers do what they want to do, what their hearts tell them to do. But unbeknownst to them, God is at work in their hearts, in their minds to accomplish his sovereign purposes. This is exactly what we read in Proverbs 21, verse 1, where scripture says, the king's heart, It's like channels of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. You see, ultimately, ultimately, God is the one calling the shots when it comes to decisions made by kings, by presidents, by prime ministers, and by other government leaders. Though they are completely unaware of this, they actually carry out the sovereign will of God. And folks, that's exactly what happened when Caesar Augustus, when this man decided to take a census to tax his subjects, never thinking that his decree would be the means by which God would move Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem in fulfillment of Micah's prophecy that the Messiah would be born there. Nevertheless, Caesar Augustus was God's instrument to accomplish his will in bringing the Son of God into the world thinking he was making a decision in his best interests, and that his decision was made solely by him. In reality, this this ungodly pagan man did exactly what God wanted him to do, and remarkably, God did not coerce Caesar to do his will by forcing him to do anything he didn't desire to do. God simply put it into this man's mind, to take this census at this precise time, and that's exactly what Caesar himself wanted to do at this precise time. So how does all this information about God sovereignly controlling the mind, the actions of Caesar Augustus, how does that affect us today? How does it affect you? How are we to apply this truth to our lives about God being sovereign over government rulers to our lives today? Well, it's really very simple. We apply this truth by simply trusting the Lord. Because even when you disagree with government decisions and those decisions make absolutely no sense to you and world events appear out of control, you can and you must trust God that all these decisions and events are under his sovereign control. And that's what we see in the story of the birth of Christ. We see the sovereignty of God demonstrated. So we see it in action as he mysteriously moved on the mind of Caesar Augustus in order to make a decree that brought Joseph 
and Mary to Bethlehem. So that in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy that Caesar Augustus knew nothing about, Jesus would be born there. But sovereignty is not the only character quality of God's that we see related to the birth of Christ. As Luke continues his Christmas narrative, he reveals another divine character quality, and that is he reveals something of the humility of Christ. Christ being God, so this is the humility of Christ. Notice verse 6. While they were there, the days were completed for her, that's Mary, to give birth. Now Luke tells us that sometime, <coughs> excuse me, sometime after Joseph and Mary arrived in the town of Bethlehem, it was time for her to give birth. And then in very simple, straightforward, very non-technical language, Luke describes the most important birth in the history of humanity. The birth of the God-man, Jesus the Messiah. Verse 7, she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In language that is both plain and majestic, at the same time, Luke tells us three things about the birth of Jesus. First thing he tells us is that Mary gave birth to her firstborn son. And what's significant about this is that it tells us that while the conception of Jesus was miraculous and mysterious, his birth was not. It was like any other human birth. Though the thought of God becoming man is mind-boggling, it is astounding, it is spectacular, his actual birth was not out of the ordinary. After nine months, his mother gave birth to him. Second thing Luke tells us about the birth of Jesus is that after he was born, Mary wrapped him in cloths. And once again, the way that Jesus was treated just after his birth was not unusual. It was not out of the ordinary. In that day, it was customary for all newborns to be wrapped tightly in strips of cloth. Why? Well, this was done to provide warmth. It was done to provide security. It was done to keep the baby's bones firm and straight. And so Jesus, as a newborn, was handled in the same manner that all newborns were handled. Now, it's the third and the final thing that Luke tells us about the birth of Jesus that where we see the humility of our Lord. We read that he was laid in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. After being born and then wrapped tightly in these long linen cloths, we read that Jesus was then placed in a manger. And though this has led many to assume that Jesus was born in a stable, that's not necessarily the case. You see, while the word manger means a feeding trough for animals, these troughs were found wherever animals might be kept. In fact, those of you who have been with me to Israel on tour might recall that we actually saw a feeding trough in Megiddo where Solomon kept his horses. It was out in the open. The fact is, no one knows today for certain exactly where Jesus was born. We know it was in the town of Bethlehem. Where? We don't know exactly. However, a very early tradition states that he was born in a cave. And sometimes animals were kept in caves in order to protect them from the elements. But regardless of where, the exact location of our Lord's birth, we know for certain that right after his birth, he was placed in a trough used to feed animals. And the reason he was placed there, as Luke tells us, is because there was just no room for them in the inn. Now, why there was no room for them in the inn, Luke doesn't tell us. He doesn't reveal that. The most likely reason is that with so many Jewish people like Joseph and Mary coming to Bethlehem for the census, and with the census being taken by Roman officials and soldiers, many extra people who ordinarily would not be there were in that town, in the town of Bethlehem. So the town's inn was naturally overcrowded. It was filled. There isn't any indication from the text that the innkeeper was a heartless man who turned away a young couple about to give birth. There just wasn't a room available. 
for them in the inn. So Mary had to give birth in a place where animals were kept. The animals belonging to those who did have a room at the inn. That's the most reasonable explanation. Now regardless of why there was no room for Joseph and Mary in the inn, the fact that Mary was forced to give birth amongst the animals, folks, that is a picture of incredible humility for the entrance of the Son of God, the sovereign one of the universe, into this world. But it was a fitting entrance because our Lord's entire life on earth spoke of his humility. Consider this. Though he was a king, he was treated like a pauper. Though he created and owned everything in the universe, he said he had nowhere to lay his head. Though he brought the Jewish people into existence and made them his covenant people. When he came to his own, they did not receive him. Though he is God, yet he gave up his rights to always use his divine attributes, and he humbled himself so that he became a servant and obediently went to the cross to die for the sins of others. So from his birth until his death, no one demonstrated more humility, more lowliness of mind than Jesus. Remember, he is the sovereign one who rules over governments. He is the humble one. But just to get a sense of just how low our Lord stooped in order to enter this world, I want you to hear the way Kent Hughes, Bible teacher and former pastor Kent Hughes, so graphically describes what Christ's birth was really like. He writes this. In Bethlehem, the accommodations for travelers were primitive. The Eastern Inn was the crudest of arrangements. Typically, it was a series of stalls built on the inside of an enclosure and opening onto a common yard where the animals were kept. All the innkeeper provided was hay for the animals and a fire to cook on. On that cold day, when the expectant parents arrived, nothing at all was available, not even one of those crude stalls. And despite the urgency, no one would make room for them. So it was probably in the common courtyard where the traveler's animals were tied that Mary gave birth to Jesus, with only Joseph attending her. Joseph probably wept as much as Mary did, seeing her pain, the sinking barnyard, their poverty, the people's indifference, the humiliation, and the sense of utter hopelessness, or helplessness rather, feeling shame at not being able to provide for young Mary on the night of her travail, all that would make a man either curse or cry. If we imagine that Jesus was born in a freshly swept country fair stable, we miss the whole point. It was wretched, scandalous. There was sweat and pain and blood and cries as Mary reached up to the heavens for help. The earth was cold and hard. The smell of birth mixed with the stench of manure and bitter-smelling straw made a contemptible bouquet. Trembling carpenter's hands, clumsy with fear, grasped God's son, slippery with blood, the baby's limbs waving helplessly as if falling through space, his face grimacing as he gasped in the cold and his cry pierced the night. Folks, this is how far the Son of God, sovereign one of the universe, creator, descended when he left the splendor of heaven, the splendor of glory to be born in the midst of foul-smelling livestock in a remote village in the Middle East. Jesus was born into this world as the lowest of men. But he was born like this, and he lived like this in total humility all of his life, and, and that includes even his death when he humbled himself by letting evil men crucify him so that he would die as a substitute sin bearers, sin bear for others. People like you, people like me. In other words, he humbled himself on the cross by enduring the wrath of God. The wrath of God poured out for our sin, but it was poured out on Christ who was the sinless one. And undeserving of that wrath. But that all happened so he could save us from God's wrath. Though we are sinful and we deserve it. The, the innocent one was punished 
in our place, the guilty ones. God is holy. He must punish sin. Christ, the sinless one, was punished in the place of sinners. That's the heart of the gospel. That's the meaning of Christmas. He came into this world to save sinners. So I ask you tonight, Christmas Eve, 2022, have you ever trusted Christ as your Savior, as your Lord? Do you just know about Him, or do you know Him personally? Have you ever turned from your sin and turned to Christ, admitting you're a sinner, there's no other way to go to heaven, but you place your faith, your trust in Christ alone, believing that when He died on the cross, He was dying for your sins, If you will do that, the Bible says that you'll be forgiven of all of your sins. It's nothing that you do in the sense of a work. It's an attitude of heart. You turn from your sin. You turn to Christ. You call out for his mercy to save you, believing in your heart that his death is totally sufficient to do that. If you've never done that, I urge you to do that. I urge you, let tonight be the night of your salvation. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are the sovereign one, the all-powerful one of the universe. And, and yet, Lord, you who are the greatest, you who raise up governments and just dismiss them like that, you became the lowest of men. Coming into this world in the crudest of arrangements, the crudest of cradles amongst animals, And you did it for us. You loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, I pray if there's any here or watching who have never trusted you for eternal life that tonight will be that time when they trust you. Only you can work in their hearts to bring about salvation. But we pray that that will be accomplished. And for the rest of us, Lord, Thank you for these reminders of your sovereignty in control of everything and your humility, Lord. Such a servant, and we thank you for that. Thank you for for doing all of this for such wretched people as we are. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.